I'm Jim Kircher, and Living St. Louis in this summer of 2020 will be looking back at St. Louis in the 20th century. From our archives, the series we call Decades. A lot of it, of course, will seem, well, dated, but much of it will seem very much like today's news. These are the stories of how we got to where we are today. On the premiere of Decades, a look at St. Louis in the first 10 turbulent years of the 20th century. As St. Louis sets out to put on the biggest World's Fair ever, there are battles in the streets, city officials being carried off to jail, and the horrifying possibility that visitors from around the world will be drinking Mississippi mud. Decades was a co-production of the Missouri History Museum and the Nine Network of Public Media. The Decades series was one of the biggest history projects we ever did, and why not? We were approaching the turn of the century. What better time to take a look back at 100 years of history? And St. Louis gives you a great place to start the story of the 20th century. The Louisiana Purchase Exposition, the 1904 World's Fair. It was a big success, a huge image boost for a city that in many ways really needed it. As St. Louis moved from the 1800s into the 1900s, there was a lot of work to be done. The city had been chosen as the site for a World's Fair, finally. St. Louis had made a pitch 10 years before for the Columbian Exposition. Bad enough they didn't get it. Worse, that it had gone to rival Chicago. So now, David R. Francis, who had been both mayor and governor, was head of the fair committee, and he was determined to outdo Chicago with a bigger and grander St. Louis Fair. The planners chose Forest Park from among a number of sites. When the trees were cleared, it would be a clean slate, far from the heart of the city. Yet still, St. Louis itself would be on display to the world, and that presented some problems. Smoky skies, unpaved streets, slums, political corruption, to name a few. There were those who'd been trying to deal with some of these problems, and now with the fair, the social reformers and the civic boosters found some common ground. At the very least, the most glaring problems might be solved and St. Louis made more presentable to the world. I think those, uh, those 10 years probably were the most important in a lot of ways uh, that this, this city has ever seen. It couldn't be business as usual anymore. And in 1901, people elected as mayor Rollo Wells, a wealthy businessman who had promised to bring about a new St. Louis. It was here on Lindell Boulevard that Wells kicked things off. In 1901, this was the new home of the exclusive private St. Louis Club. And the new mayor invited politicians and business leaders for a formal dinner and a World's Fair pep talk. It behooves the people of this city through their public officers to place their municipal home in proper order so that the guests that come in our midst will be properly received and impressed with the greatness and grandeur that St. Louis is deserving. It is my opinion that there is but one way to accomplish this end, and that is by cooperation. With that spirit prevailing, there can be but one result, and that is a new St. Louis. Talk of unity and cooperation was appropriate in 1901, partly because 1900 had been a terrible year for St. Louis. It was a time when people had taken up arms against each other, fighting for the very control of the city streets, a battle that left damage, injury, and death. There's this notion that there's no class conflict in the United States. I don't know how you can look at the 1900 streetcar strike and say there was no class conflict in the United States and certainly in St. Louis, workers would have thought that was a foolish statement in 1900 or even beyond that. 
Turn of the century, streetcar workers had familiar gripes. Long hours, low pay, no job security, and a company that refused to recognize their union. The streetcar company, which kept the city moving and growing, was a monopoly run by wealthy men living in the West End. In the north and south side working class neighborhoods, the transit company was known for poor service, arrogance, and disdain for its customers and their safety. Both sides dug in on principle. They knew the issues went beyond one company and its workers. This was not only a strike about you know, control, reduced working hours. They did call for a 10-hour day in 1900 for the streetcar workers for better wages. They called for these broad demands for the entire working class of the city. Uh, but because they were calling for the organization of the entire working class and because there were socialists involved in the labor movement, you know, this was a radical union city that had radical goals. The strike began May 8, 1900. Workers and supporters immediately moved to try to shut the system down. They piled rocks on the tracks and built barricades. They strung on the overhead trolley lines all kinds of things, pots and pans, shoes, even the stuffed dummy of a scab. The company brought in strike breakers and armed guards to try to keep the streetcars running where they could and to protect passengers. Strike supporters threw rocks, threatened and beat up riders. Some women riders had their clothes ripped. It was dangerous business trying to ride a streetcar in a working class St. Louis neighborhood. Workers in St. Louis really identified with the idea that they had the right to control the streets in their neighborhood. They may not be able to control their workplace conditions, which was more centrally located, but they had the right to control the streets. They had the right to shut down the streetcar lines. They were completely shut down in the north side and the south side by this working class activity. Strikers organized a boycott and it was effective. People walked, the streets were filled with all kinds of horse-drawn vehicles, some supplied by the union itself. There was broad support from different ethnic groups, from workers and merchants, from housewives and shop girls. On the other side, a posse was organized from among St. Louis's wealthier citizens. The legal justification was the need to keep running the streetcars which carried the U.S. mail. On June 10th, a month into the strike, there was a confrontation downtown between a parade of strikers and the posse. The posse fired into the crowd, killing three people. This is how the new century was ushered in, in the city chosen to host the World's Fair. The strike dragged through the summer, support for the boycott faded, and it was all over in September. The transit workers had failed to win recognition. But the strike exposed deep divisions within St. Louis, and Mayor Wells was right. A World's Fair city had to work together. St. Louis could not afford another crisis like the transit strike of 1900. That's one direct outcome, is that they had peace and quiet during the fair, in large part because the elite actually recognized some unions. These were primarily skilled trades unions. And in turn, uh, many of the unions made sure that there were no strikes during the course of the fair. In fact, unions might have effectively, had this uh, 1900 strike not happened, they might have effectively shut down the fair and spoiled the whole thing. In 1900, St. Louis was still a growing city of 575,000. Boosters were shooting for a million. It was the fourth largest city in America, but a distant fourth to New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Most people were first-generation Americans or foreign-born. There were a lot of different ethnic groups, lots of languages, but this was a very German city. 
Laura Marsalek was born in St. Louis in 1894. She turned six during the summer of the streetcar strike. She grew up knowing two languages, but it was English she spoke at home, German you learned to get by in the neighborhood. I picked it up from the neighbors. My, uh, they spoke it all together. They didn't speak no English at all. And if I wanted to know, know what they were saying to me, and especially when they'd bake and call me to get something good they baked, I had to learn it. I had to learn German. We used to get our vegetables um, from a farmer that came in, and uh, he was a singing farmer. And he'd come in and sing out his, uh, what he had, what vegetables he had. Shane in German, Shane the Green Nivona, that's green beans, you know. They lived in a flat on South Broadway. Laura's father was a house painter. There were lots of jobs in turn of the century St. Louis. The downtown skyscrapers were filled with managers, clerks, and telephone operators. In those days, you could shoe horses or build automobiles. You could work in a printing plant. You could roll steel or roll cigars, work in a box factory or a brewery. Thousands of people were employed in the garment district along Washington Avenue and in the couple's station warehouses by the rail yard. The levee would never be what it had been in the 1800s, but there were still boats and jobs and black workers, as they had for a long time, were doing much of the loading and unloading. At the turn of the century, African Americans made up about 6% of St. Louis's population. Nobody talked much about what was later called the Negro problem. But serious social issues involving race would soon have to be dealt with. You have increasingly, as we approach the 1900 mark, uh, a growing professional class of teachers. Um, we're beginning to have physicians, lawyers. You also have an upper class community of African Americans in St. Louis that have always been here since before the Civil War. This too was the heyday of ragtime. The clubs in St. Louis drew the great ragtime artists, and Scott Joplin was publishing his rags and selling them all over the country. It was just one small part of what was going on in this American city. I think that's an important thing to remember, that people at the turn of the century believed that cities were good places. They were the center of, of culture and economics. How do we keep th those things that we need in the city and also make it more livable and, and and better able to govern it. Government was a problem. The impressive new city hall was riddled with corruption. The most powerful man in politics didn't even have an office here. He wasn't appointed or elected to anything. He was just the boss. Irish-born Ed Butler, he came to St. Louis a blacksmith and ended up running a political machine. By the turn of the century, boss Butler had been controlling votes for 25 years. To get things done at City Hall, you had to pay off Butler's men. Everybody knew how it worked, and big business played right along. They called it Boodle. It just became that you had to pay for everything. That's when they came up with the price list. See, they came up with price lists, and they would simply show you the price list and say, oh, you're asking, for, here's what the price is for that. This one's 10000 this one's 25000 You decide, and then you pay us. We'll take care of Boss Butler. Uh, we'll pass out the money within our combine. Uh, and uh, that's the way it will be. Muckraking journalist Lincoln Steffens embarrassed St. Louis in his nationally published writings on corruption. He said that St. Louis was making two announcements to the world, one that it was the worst governed city in the world, the other that everyone should come there for the World's Fair. Steffens started his series in St. Louis City Hall because he had a good story with a hero, Joseph Folk. Folk had tried to help settle the streetcar strike in 1900 and then was asked to run for circuit attorney. Ed Butler's machine helped deliver the votes and then Folk turned on the very system that put him into office. He went after the boodlers, not just the ones in City Hall, but those in big business. In the years leading up to the World's Fair, the papers were filled with headlines of investigations, disappearing suspects, confessions, grand juries, and trials. 
Because of Joseph Folk, 24 politicians and businessmen were indicted, including Boss Butler himself. Folk can certainly be credited with having, uh, by and large, put the boodling on its last legs in St. Louis, even though not everybody went to jail and not everybody stayed in jail if they got there. Ed Butler's conviction didn't hold up, but the days of his old-style boss rule in St. Louis were over. As for Joseph Folk, or Holy Joe, as some called him, his anti-boodling crusade got him elected governor of Missouri in 1905. Mayor Wells had kept his distance from Folk's brand of reform. Instead of cleaning out City Hall, the mayor was busy paving streets, putting in street lights, and building sewers, and tackling a problem that affected everyone in the city, from the poorest slum dweller to the richest West End millionaire. St. Louisans had long lived with, cooked with, drank, and bathed in dirty water. The old saying was, too thick to drink, too thin to plow. But until the World's Fair, nobody seemed to mind that much. I remember my mother saying to my father, just let it run, and it'll finally clear up. I guess sometimes they'd leave it run a half hour, and it'd still be muddy. This became a particularly pressing issue at the turn of the century, because St. Louis was about to have a World's Fair, and water was going to be an important component in this World's Fair. They had planned to decorate the fair with lagoons, with waterfalls, with fountains. How would it look to the rest of the world if there's muddy water pouring out of the statuary? The city's water intake was at the Chain of Rocks near the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers and there was still plenty of dirt in it when it was pumped to the water towers and then throughout the city. A panel of experts looked at two solutions, building a filtration system or finding a new water source, but neither proposal met Mayor Wells' budget restrictions or his deadline. Whatever was done had to be in place by the World's Fair. So they tried something new, chemicals, coagulants, which pulled the dirt out of the water, and it cleared up. And even though they had to cut back on the chemicals when the seals and the fish at the fair started to die off, they got what they wanted. Crystal clear water was the visual centerpiece of the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition. The summer of the World's Fair, Laura Marsalek turned 10 years old. The Cascades were beautiful. Whenever we went, we always went for the day. And of course, they had so many interesting things at the World's Fairs, things that we never saw before. And um, it was a wonderful, marvelous place to be. It was the result of years of planning, fundraising, and construction, and David R. Francis's tireless worldwide promotion. This was supposed to have been the 1903 St. Louis World's Fair, but there was so much to do, it opened a year late. In St. Louis history, there really is nothing else like the World's Fair. But in the bigger picture, this was one of the great fairs of the era. St. Louis and Chicago and Buffalo and San Francisco and Omaha, they shared a great deal in their fairgrounds. Even though each city will give you a different line explaining why its fair was special, and each fair was special, but the resemblances, I think, are stronger than uh, the dissimilarities. And it's, you're not sure where you are when you take a look at those wonderful photographs. In the days before movie theaters, before broadcasting, this was the only place you could see the world and its people. It was beautiful, instructive, and fun a collection of the best music, science, technology, and entertainment, and food from around the world, set amid incredible gardens and dazzling views. These were vanishing cities, and um, you had six months to see them, and that was it. That's why so many people attended. Tens of millions of people went to these fairs. For people who lived in St. Louis, the experience of a lifetime was just a streetcar ride away. Edmund Philibert was a 30-year-old St. Louis carpenter who went to the fair 28 times. 
each night meticulously recording his experiences. I made my 23rd visit to the fair today. We stopped at the wireless telegraph station. They could send messages to Chicago and several other places. After lunch, we went to the baby incubators. One baby was as small as a doll. Its hand was about as big as my thumb. We went to the Chinese village next and saw the fire eater perform the same tricks as usual. It cost 50 cents to get into the fair and more after that for food and different attractions, especially along the pike, the long strip of sideshows and rides where the real fun was. The dancers, the magicians, the fun houses. There was something for everyone. One 10-year-old girl was fascinated by the Filipino natives living on the fairgrounds. They had them on this, in this little village out there at the fair, and I was very much interested in them. I used to tell my mother, let's go to see the Eagle Villages and see what they're doing today. The Philippines had become a U.S. possession after the Spanish-American War. On the pike, you could pay to see a reenactment of an American naval victory using model ships. Another whole section of the fair was devoted to the Philippine history and culture that included the Igorot village. Today, it would seem unthinkable to display real people in such a way, but the fair was an unabashed celebration of Western civilization, of its superior intellectual and scientific achievements, and the firm belief that if we could spread that around the world, everyone would be better off. We know these fairs were racially segregated and they rested on a, um, a rather ethnocentric vision of the world. They were something with all of their prejudices that we are not, which is self-confident about themselves and their future. December 1st, 1904. I made my 28th and last visit to the World's Fair today. It made me feel a little sad to think that it would soon be all over forever, for I had spent many pleasant days there but everything must come to an end sometime. So I left the Lindell entrance for the last time at about half past seven. It was clear to many people that the great progress and growth since the Civil War had come at a price. In the years following the World's Fair, a number of studies took on important issues dealing with health and quality of city life. A 1906 report on waste disposal, another on the serious smoke problem. All of these issues were spoken at, in terms of a moral crisis, air pollution. Um, this was not just a matter of harming health or being an inconvenience and nuisance to people, uh, but something that would debilitate people morally. It threatened um, the moral core of the citizenry. In 1908, a reform group called the Civic League of St. Louis surveyed one of the city's worst slums and published an illustrated report on its findings. The great lack of running water, faulty drainage, poor fire protection, unhealthy toilet and bathing arrangements. The report's author was Charlotte Rumbold. Every fact indicates the abnormality of these conditions. The economic and social misery involved also point to the duty of the municipality to relieve them. Charlotte Rumbold is really the prototypical progressive era woman, the new woman of the, of the turn of the century. She never married. She studied abroad, social work. Uh, and social work and social service work was, of course, a new profession and a profession that many women went into. So that when she came back to St. Louis, she was really ready to uh, roll up her sleeves and start uh, working for the city. She first took up the issue of children. A women's group called the Wednesday Club worked to establish playgrounds in the most crowded parts of the city and started summer programs. A supporter called this a work for good citizenship, good fatherhood, and noble motherhood. This is the progressive era, uh, the era from, uh, from the very top levels of authority, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, down to people like Jane Addams at Hull House and other reformers here in St. Louis and other cities. Women's groups were also active in the movement to build public bathhouses. 
In many apartments and rented rooms, there were often no built-in showers or bathtubs or indoor toilets, and sometimes no running water. The city eventually built six public bathhouses where people could hang up their clothes and get themselves clean. It was seen as a way the city could improve the health, the dignity, and the moral well-being of its citizens. This is a problem-solving period. It's a new century. It's an idea we can solve these problems we have created. I think that may be one of the uh, big differences between that time and ours. There's a much greater optimism about the fact that we can solve social problems. It just is a matter of will. They were combining scientific methods, new technology, and reformed government to change things. It was exactly what had been on display and at the heart of the World's Fair of 1904. In some ways, Mayor Wells was right. There was a new St. Louis. There was momentum for the civic boosters and for the social reformers. Certainly some of the problems they faced are still with us today, but so are some of the solutions they came up with. For decades, I'm Jim Kircher.